afternoon, everyone. Hello. It's always a very good sign when you have to say hello twice because it means that the conversation and the hubbub is so lively that you have to interrupt it. So obviously we're off to a good start and you're already deep in conversation about all things Rosettes. Uh, my name is Sarah Turner and I'm Acting Director at the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art. And it gives me great pleasure to open this conference and say a few words of welcome uh, to you all. Um, Rosetti's In Relation is a collaborative conference organised by the Paul Mellon Centre, Tate Britain and the History of Art Department at the University of York. First of all, I want to welcome all of you here. It's absolutely wonderful to see you all here on a, a bright sunny day um, and I hope you'll be comfortable it's lovely actually to be in a bit of a cooler room um, and I want to say thank you to all of our speakers our chairs our panelists and organizers and attendees you've also generously given their time to gather here for this special occasion when Carol Jacobi uh, pitched the idea of a conference to me time to coincide with the Rossetti's exhibition what she sketched out in our first conversation was a visit, uh, was a vision for a, a, an entwined um, exhibition and event that presented a different kind of model for thinking about how artists' careers and lives are shaped. Not as those singular and self-contained monographic subjects, but one, an approach that is relational, collaborative, and part of familial and professional networks. And through further conversations with our, with our colleagues, we shaped a call that spoke to the themes of relationality, of connection, of Rosetta's plural. So I'm really grateful to Carol uh, for being a collaborator, to James Finch and, and colleagues at Tate Britain, and especially the team um, in the AV box and, um, and outside who are supporting, helping us feel comfortable and welcome in this space. And I'm also very grateful to my colleagues at the Paul Mellon Centre, particularly to our Head of Research and Learning, Shreya Chatterjee, who is very much part of this team, but unfortunately isn't well today, so can't be with us. And to our events lead, Ella Fleming, who many of you have met, and our events assistant, Kathleen Ward. Um, and I also want to say a special thank you to our collaborative partners at the, the History of Art Department um, at the University of York, particularly Professor Liz Pretjohn, who's going to chair our first session but also to Edward, Eduardo de Mayo and Nicholas Dun McAfee and also Robin Valentine, who has helped us today. Eduardo and Nicholas joined Carol, Shreer and me in selecting the papers uh, for this event, and we're particularly grateful to Eduardo and Nicholas uh, for their help in circulating the call widely, and I think that has really given this conference a particular shape and texture and, and flavour, um, and also for giving us a sense of some of the new directions of research in this field. And again, I think this conference speaks in particular to that. A lot of the uh, responses we received were from PhD students, from early career researchers. And again, perhaps this is something we can talk about in the panels and in the Q&A sessions, is something about the future of work um, in this field. And I know Carol is particularly interested in thinking about that and thinking about the kinds of work that exhibitions can project into the future. Um, as I said, we were quite overwhelmed by the scale and quality of the response to the call. We received uh, 65 abstracts in total, and I have to say all of them were irrelevant, and all of them were to an extremely high standard. And I organise a lot of conferences. <laughs> I can tell you that is not always the case. So um, it, it really was um, a, a response of, of quality, of provocation, um, and really high standard. And it gave us a very tough job to whittle them down to 15 papers, and six presentations in the exhibition. Um, but we're particularly grateful to people who um, we couldn't select, but who have also come along to today um, as attendees. And the next two days that we share together really are about making connections and sharing knowledge. So we hope that all of you in this room will feel welcome um, to share your um, responses, your knowledge, your ideas, and your research through the panel discussions and the Q&A we have, but we've also got a reception and time together in the exhibition. So we see this as a, an event of many different kinds of moments. So we hope you will very much contribute um, to that. 
Tim Ingold's metaphor of mesh work um, is something I've been thinking about recently in my own work, um, and it refers to how individuals and knowledges are entanglements and how they emerge through encounters with others um, as lines of becoming, is what uh, Ingold says. And as I've been encountering the Rosetti's exhibition, um, I've been thinking about the exhibition and also the conference as a kind of mesh work bringing together the verbal and the visual in very evocative ways, but also those com very complex and entangled lives and how we think about those in relationship to works of art and how those um, histories are narrated in the, the art history we write and the exhibitions um, we create. So I hope the conference really gives us a space and a time to think through the meshwork of the Rosettes. And I look forward to having many more conversations with you um, as these, uh, over the next few days and as the conference unfolds. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague and collaborator, Carol Jacobi, um, to say more about the event and the exhibition. Thank you so much, Sarah. And yes, can I add my thanks to uh, everyone's vision and energy um, and, and support in making this happen, and particularly to Sarah herself. So, um, I'm just going to take a few minutes uh, to make some opening remarks. And um, way back before the pandemic, there was a proposal to give Dante Gabriel Rossetti his first Tate retrospective. And we'd done John Everett Millet in 2007, Edward Ben Jones in 2018, and Rossetti was the next major paraphylite for whom we have canonical works. And this is belated, but I'm glad because it did, it, we did a different thing than we would have done five years earlier, I think. Where the, Rossetti's, the Rossetti name is owned by Dante Gabriel Rossetti in the arts and Christina uh, in the world of literature, although her brother was also a poet, we considered... Um, doing the Rossettis, um, doing both of them, and fellow artist and po poet Elizabeth, who was born Siddal uh, and died Rossetti following her marriage to Gabriel. Um, we also put them against the background of this sort of extraordinary uh, Rossetti generation, so the eldest Maria and William in between Gabriel and Christina, and Lucy Maddox Brown Rossetti, I should add, who married William late in their lives. So I'm uh, born within four years with each other. They were very close, but I often sort of think sympathetically about their mother, Frances, and what that was like. <laughs> so th this departure was possible because curators and collections of historical art across the world have been fundamentally rethinking and changing what we do and why we do it. And I think old art is, in a way, at the moment, the nearest frontier. And it will be fascinating to hear speakers and delegates' ideas over the next two, year, two days and how we are writing, curating, I think, in five years' time. I see this exhibition as a set of provocations and experiments in the spirit of, of this rethinking, and I hope um, they will connect in different ways across the papers and discussions. At its core has been the expertise of many scholars and collectors and curators, some of whom I'm really pleased to see here. And Jan Marsh was our ever knowledgeable and patient consultant. Our provocations arose from three related questions. Whose views and voices are seen and heard and how? And this applies to both the protagonists and those that frame their work, past and present. Secondly, when looking at and talking about historic art, how do we address the disparity between 21st century values and the values of the past, and obviously especially in relation to gender, class, race, sexuality, and other now protected characteristics? And we want to do this in a way that enhances a diverse modern experience of it. And three, should we, should we show and talk about historic works that pertain to harmful histories or under and misrepresented groups? And if we do, how do we deal with those distortions or harms? So to expand uh, on these just a little, whose views and voices are seen and heard and how? And as Sarah's already mentioned, the first provocation was to interrogate the monographic form, which I think is a broader, important theme. So take women artists like Elizabeth Siddle, for instance. Things have improved. The monograph 
is less restricted to male artists, but is a monographic but is a monographic book or show about a woman artist the equivalent to one about a male artist? And I would argue not yet. And monographic shows have the advantage of researching women artists on their own terms, even at length, but in doing so, they leave them untethered from mainstream critical and art historical na narratives, and they, and they rarely anchor, especially in historical period. So how far do monographs about women artists full of new research change the dominant narrative, inform and generate other texts and exhibitions? So there was 26 years between Jan Marsh's groundbreaking retrospective of Elizabeth, the first retrospective of Elizabeth's work in 1992 and Hannah Squire's groundbreaking Beyond Ophelia in 2018 at Whitwick Manor. And that is the point um, a monographic siddle show is still 26 years groundbreaking and hard to achieve, so it has not been normalized. The alternative to incorporate women into groups is perhaps more problematic. While they are, tend to be numerically, um, have token roles, or be viewed uncomfortably through narratives that they have not influenced. A third way um, is for, um, is where her art, perhaps Siddle's art, um, can be set can, within the door, can display against the dominant narratives in a more active, reciprocally dominant way, such that those narratives are rewritten and, and revised with her influencing and in them. And I think we saw that, see this in the Gwen John show and various other people are exploring this. So the Rossettis gave us a really singular opportunity to take this third way in an exhibition comprising one man and two women and to change expectations as people even go in the show by starting with a woman. And of course, Christina um, is the most famous of the three, the first to come to the into the public eye at just 16, and she was also the last to die at 94. To do this, we needed to disrupt other hierarchies that maintain the status quo of image over word, uh, big over small, oil over watercolor, Elizabeth's only oil is lost, familiar over unfamiliar, famous over not famous. We experimented with actualizing the poems um, in the form of sound showers and also we're distilling the poems around the gallery in these 30 word vignettes. We used Victorian and modern reproductions to put lost works back into the story. And we played around with size to recoat focus on drawings and watercolors um, and, and also with layout. These experiments were not always conclusive I tried to introduce one or two new icons into the publicity around the show, for example, but I did not succeed with this. So I'm back to the drawing board with how we achieve that. So the relational model, as Sarah put it, three artists seen in wider social and cultural contexts, complementing the, the title of this um, conference, is transforming our understanding of all those artists. I think that's key. It also facilitates 31st 21st century readings. The Rossettis modeled for each other, edited and illustrated each other's poems, shared and contested each other's themes, particularly that of love in all its forms. And we see, for example, the so-called brotherhood, not as seven men, but as a collective of men and women, not as, not as priests of truth to nature, but experimenters with art and lived experience, seen and felt. And they're all the protagonists of each other's uh, pictures, which is very startling. The roles of Christina and Elizabeth come into view uh, as they join, uh, uh, particularly Elizabeth, joining as a working class woman who had set out to write and paint. And she sits with Coleman Hunt as one of the first artists to illustrate Tennyson. Later, she prepares for the Moxon edition only to be excluded in favor of male prophylites, including Gabriel, whose designs for the book draw on hers. And we've all been there. Most importantly, we see that crucial turn 
in the room that turns the exhibition between the realism of paraphletism in their 20s and an expressive decorative art based in imagination, laying the foundations for a second avant-garde. Uh, also often called paraphletism, but best understood as the movement of aestheticism. Glenda Yude has shown how during this decisive period, Elizabeth and Gabriel shared not only studio, but ideas, materials, sources, and patrons, and made this change together. And so, for example, this picture comes before this, the other one. Elizabeth's four figures, lovers listening to music in this room, playing and singing with its mix of medievalism and orientalism was a very early subjectless picture that predated Gabriel's medieval oriental four singers, the blue closet, which is seen as a prophecy of asceticism. Elizabeth's motive of the lover's wood informs Gabriel's poetry and the wallpaper, which he designed for their married home and which they're hung against. We also see how Christina and Elizabeth bring a pithy directness and more diverse voices and experience to their work from popular and vernacular songs far more than Gabriel does. And sort of how about Christina's wonderful line, he wore me like a silken tie, he changed me like a glove. The Rossettis together draw our attention to laboring girls and women all the Rossetti children, except Gabriel, were working in their early teens, like their mother due to the illness of their father. Christina and Maria maintain their professional life as single women, and Elizabeth too, until her 30s. And this is always presented as Rossetti sort of failing to commit, um, but there were really good practical reasons why Elizabeth might want to stay single. The privileges of class, status, and gender are firmly present in our historical collections today, and this exhibition was an unusual opportunity to enjoy cultural perspectives of people from the working class. Elizabeth shared a working class background with Jane Morris and a paid profession as a model with Fanny Cornforth, Fanny Eaton, and others. She shared an artistic profession with Christina and Jane. And I think we forget this. We sort of categorize them away from each other, and we often reframe Elizabeth and Jane as middle class when we talk about activities such as painting, writing, or travel as, um, uh, that we associate with the middle class. And so they sort of, well, there's this sort of Cinderella uh, story that sort of attaches itself to them. We particularly drew on research that is bringing working class experience into view. So uh, exciting new publications uh, on Elizabeth, notably Serena Trowbridge's restoration of her poems, which had been approved by William, to literally her own voice. Uh, Kirsty Stonell Walker's work on the career of Fanny Cornforth, including her correspondence with the Rossetti collector Samuel Bancroft, the basis of the collection of our partners, Delaware Art Museum. And the work of Brian Eaton on the life of his great grandmother, Fanny Eaton, and her children. Research into Eaton contributes to a room that brings into the foreground the work of modeling and role and experience of professional sitters before Gabriel's fantasized pictures, in this case, the beloved. And this room, following on from rooms foregrounding the agency of Fanny Cornforth and, of course, Elizabeth, is deliberately placed before the space filled with the famous mythical women so that these might strike visitors in a more complex and critical way. The theme continues in the room devoted to Jane Morris alongside Gabriel's pictures of her. We also address those views and voice, um, whose views and voices are seen and heard with our catalogue. Rather than draw together an overall thesis, the catalogue assembles different perspectives, methodologies, and areas of ex ex expertise, such as English literature, in the case of Dinah Rowe and Wendy Parkins. This also helped us address the last question about how we deal with art that represents harm, such as racism or abuse. An, an, an essay devoted to found and the broader um, world of buying and selling a sex foregrounds Fanny and contemporary records of the voices of women who sold sex to men, recorded by Henry Mayhew, as well as Christina's allegory of prostitution and survival, the goblin market, in the context of her 10 years working with refugees in, from the trade. Another example, um, Chiesa Madero, 
draws on a different methodological approach, um, Sadia Hartman's critical confabulism, to make visible the racist dynamic of the beloved and at the same time give voice to the young boy who, whose name is not recorded in the foreground. And in a surprising synergy, the technical research project of our conservation team, Amy Griffin, Gabrielle Maccaro, and Joyce Tennyson, filled in all sorts of new information of his sitting and studio experience. And finally, a transformative factor for me was to interrogate our language, which we sifted and re-sifted, and our interpretation team were endlessly uh, saintly patient. Our ideas are moving on so fast at the moment, I'm certain that even in two months, I will see biases in my words that I'm not seeing now. I think we're all having this experience, I hope other people are at least, of shuddering when we reread things we wrote only a few years ago. But I think our progress is changing scholarly and public perceptions. And to give just a few examples of the guideline document we created for ourselves, we replace labels which eclipse and reduce identity, such as wife and model. How often are usually women described as a model or muse, when in reality they are, they are people who model, whose main profession and identity is almost certainly something else. We eliminated words that make women and working class people the subject, so we said they married instead of he married her, for example. We checked every use of his, to make sure, and we sort of delete, we got rid of things like his student, his model, his wife. It sort of has a very cumulative effect, those phrases. And model and muse, I think, are, are, are really problematic nouns, um, especially when they are not applied to men. And Gabriel was no less Elizabeth's model and muse than she was his. And don't get me started on the way working class people are always discovered. Um, that's an interesting subject in itself. So to conclude with a reflection on Rossetti's reception. The widespread and serious appreciation of Elizabeth has been pleasing. There's even been some articles arguing that she was the real genius and so on, which has been great. <laughs> As has the public reaction to the show in general. But we have to consider the strong criticism of the show focusing on hate for Gabriel's paintings. And I think the most significant aspect is not the hate, but the insistence dominance of these late objectifying portraits, commodities in oil, as the Rossetti brand. Even sympathetic articles keen on Elizabeth were dominated by Gabriel's pictures of Alexa Wilding and Jane Morris. And we've seen a similar thing with all the obituaries for um, Francois uh, Gillot recently. Uh, it's all about um, Picasso and how awful he was to her. So, so we can see this, um, I think, as in part as a realising of the prediction of Griselda Pollock and Jebra Cherry's controversial commentary on the 1984 show at Tate, The Paraphylites. They linked the imagery and messages around the show to Thatcherite values and, cult the, cult and cult the cultural commodification of the 80s a change that we can see by comparing its imagery with the previous Rossetti show at the Royal Academy in 1973. And indeed, with hindsight, we can see there is nothing more 80s than Mona Vanna, so that's the one on the Provaf Lights, a poster with her brocades, her big shoulders, big jewelry, and big hair. And what is sobering, I think, is how little this has changed since. And by looking at sort of the, the sort of way that books and uh, exhibitions are branded, uh, still branded for the, uh, the Preflites and the Rossettis. And I wonder whether we might find some answers to how to move on today. Thank you. So um, I'm very um, pleased to introduce uh, Liz Pratchon. I probably don't need to introduce her to anyone in this room. Um, um, professor at, at York, uh, in the History of Art Department at York at the moment, collaborated with this conference. But also, uh, we, we, were, we often say, uh, creator, this a wonderful um, um, this, um, 
supervised it to a wonderful set of students um, and how, you know, in the world of Victorian art, the international world of the Victorian art, uh, you always come over, uh, come across it as a student. So she's really transformed the, the uh, field and was certainly a huge inspiration to me um, um, for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. Right, hello. Um, it's wonderful to be here, and thank you so much to the organizers for giving me the amazing privilege of being the first chair in this marvelous event. Now, you all have bios in your um, conference materials, which you have access to on the web, and our speakers, our wonderful speakers, are all quite famous people with f fantastic books, articles, and so forth, which you will want to read. But we want to give them time to speak today, so I'm not going to repeat the bi biographies by reading them out, and we will proceed uh, immediately to hearing what our speakers have to say, and then that, I hope, will give us a good amount of time to have a real discussion afterwards. So um, we will run, and I think this is going to be the pattern for the whole conference, we'll run all three of the papers in the session right away, back to back, so you'll get three amazing perspectives on things, and then have a discussion in which we can draw out some of the things that come out during all three of the papers and maybe explore some of the connections. The first panel today is called Methodologies. And I'm not sure that the, the, uh, the contributors of the papers actually designed their papers in the first instance to be uh, really about methodologies, but I know from their work that they will show us some very interesting approaches to how we might go about doing our art historical and curatorial business, and that they'll give us some new perspectives on this idea of the relational. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Natalie Prezel, who will be speaking on Dante Gabriel Rossetti's Race Relations. And I think Natalie will, will come up and she'll be seated due to, um, due to some recent surgery, which, um, um, but I, um, we'll be able to hear her very well from her um, seated position. Yes, thank you. Is that good? And you, are you okay with all the... I think, I think this should be good. Brilliant. Let's see. So, Welcome to Natalie. Okay, um, I'm gonna start with this painting and I was delighted this morning to, to go see it. I hadn't seen it actually in about eight years and to see a whole room devoted to it was extremely exciting for me. So um, without further ado. Um, so the talk I'm giving today is part of a book project I'm working on called Pre-Raphaelite in Black in which I'm going to at least this is what I think I'm going to do. I'm going to um, trace the influence of Italian art on the portrayal of black subjects in pre-Raphaelite painting, the effects of that influence, and why that influence matters, how it helps the pre-Raphaelites make social and aesthetic claims. And um, so far, I think the book is going to focus mostly on Rossetti, John Ruskin, and Simeon Solomon, with some other figures thrown in. Okay. Pre-Raphaelite painting tends to be critically understood through its relations among the members and followers of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, to its, lit its relationship with its literary sources, imagined and other otherwise, to its declared influence in the Brotherhood's list of immortals and beyond, and to continental, especially French, movements contemporaneous to it. To understand art relationally demands that we move beyond the geographic, temporal, and aesthetic silos, and it that the profession sort of imposes upon us, and it allows for surprising and compelling connections. But certain relations become prescribed and certain axes along which to understand and reconcile difference become canon. And I'm drawing on the fact that whenever I talk about this book project, the first question I get asked is, are you gonna talk about French art? So I'm gonna push back slightly on one aspect of the exhibition, and that's the connection with Manet. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's The Beloved, the painting that will be at the center of my remarks today, the Rossetti archive quotes, the Negro boy is a clear borrowing from Manet's Olympia. DGR saw the painting in Manet's studio during his 1864 trip to Paris. And this seems to be a critical consensus in explaining The Beloved. And its inclusion of a black figure does indeed present itself as something which needs to be explained. But it is worth noting that in his letters, Rossetti was nonplussed by Manet's artistic achievements. 
calling the French school, quote, simple putrescence and decomposition, Rossetti singled Manet out. There was a new man named Manet to whose studio I was taken by Fantaine, whose pictures are for the most part mere scrawls, unquote. So the most significant exemplar for Rossetti in his depiction of black subjects, I argue, is not Manet, but rather the artists of the Venetian Renaissance, and especially Titian. And I don't think he gets to Titian through Manet. I think he goes directly to Titian. This is perhaps unsurprising. After all, it was John Ruskin who wrote of his friend, quote, Rossetti is the most perfect gentleman, the nearest of Titian of any man living. I don't know how the gentleman and Titian thing are related, but they are for Ruskin. Um, the pre-Raphaelite writer F.G. Stevens calls the beloved Venetian, as he described it as the finest production of Rossetti's genius. And even critics of Rossetti's later methods reluctantly compare him to Titian. They say he never learned how to paint, but he paints like Titian. And I think we should all be so lucky. Um, both Manet and Rossetti turn to Titian in different ways. As Liz Pretjohn tells us, Manet swerves from his Titian, whereas Rossetti seeks to draw nearer. The act of drawing nearer is central to the argument of this talk. And one way Rossetti draws nearer to Titian is in his depiction of the black figure in The Beloved. Blackness is central both aesthetically and compositionally. And it is by centralizing blackness that Rossetti declares himself a Venetian painter. Furthermore, it is through an aesthetics of proximity, difference brought close, that Rossetti creates a pictorial world that demands a kind of racial reckoning, even if not tied to an easily legible political stance. And uh, here's, here's Olympia. I'll talk about it a little bit, but I'm going to try not to talk about it. Um, Matthew Francis Rary has recently given an extended, really valuable treatment of the beloved in the art bulletin, critiquing a tendency to treat the beloved in terms, quote, purely aesthetic and explicitly apolitical. The use of the term purely here deserves comment. Rossetti himself, when switching out models for the black figure in the front of the painting, as you'll see beautifully illustrated in the ex exhibition, he appealed to purity. He said um, in a letter to his buyer, George Ray, one change I propose is to take out the little mulatto girl and to paint in a pure black girl or boy, if I can get one. I mean the color of my picture to be like jewels and the jet would be invaluable. Of course, the skin of the figure Rossetti paints is not pure black. The skin is vibrant in ways that defy so many other Western European figurations of blackness, including that of Laure in uh, Olympia, and um, including some other Venetian paintings, and including Rossetti's own crude drawings of black figures. We have a couple here um, from his early career. All the figures in the painting, whatever their race or ethnicity, have a greenish cast, in fact, to their skin, the very real cast the bride's clothing would throw into their faces. So I want to jettison the notion of purest purity. What an aspiration to purity misses is the complexly imbricated relationship amongst aesthetics, ethics, and politics in 19th century art. In abandoning purity, I surrender the hope that through visual analysis of this painting, I might be able to clearly delineate Ro Rossetti's racism or anti-racism. Um, I don't think I can do that. That is not to say that Rossetti did not produce frankly racist pictures, including some of the ones I just showed you, often with racist text alongside. But the beloved is more challenging, largely because it collapses multiple binaries, social and aesthetic, black and white, Christian and secular, past and present, figure and ground, and surface and depth. And I, I'm not gonna talk about all of those, but I'm gonna touch on it. The painting can only be interpreted then according to the liminality it represents. If the aesthetic relations to which one should attend are putatively those with France, political analyses of this painting seem to demand that it is to America and the discourses of slavery, abolitionism, and the Civil War that we must turn. Rary argues that Rossetti's engagement with black subjects, quote, suggests that he viewed his moral stances as he viewed his artistic production, derived from a former, less charged, and problematic time. But I think to define a period as more or less problematic is to collapse difference in historical racial formations. So in 1929, Thomas Earl Welby wrote of the Pre-Raphaelites, movements are rather un-English, and this Victorian movement, begun under an Italianate man of genius, proceeds with many exotic stimulants, unquote. But Italianness was more than exotic for Rossetti. Any treatment of Rossetti's relations, particularly foreign ones, should remember that from Italy, Rossetti derived both aesthetic, aesthetic and political inspiration. In Rossetti's own moment, the project of U Italian unification was underway, and Venice itself was annexed in 1866 while Rossetti was painting The Beloved. Turning back to the Venetian Renaissance, Rossetti takes us to a moment 
in which race is not conceived according to the binary logic of blackness and whiteness that characterizes the period of the Atlantic slave trade. If the painting can be said to be about slavery, for example, it has to be so in a different way. And Rossetti, in fact, wrote a book as a six-year-old, a play, called The Slave. And it has, very, it has allusions to Arabian Nights and to the Merchant of Venice, but it's not thinking in terms of the Atlantic slave trade. Um, to make a very long history short, in medieval Venice, slave status attached to many different peoples. One scholar explains, quote, a firm connection between geographical origin and skin color had yet to take hold. That said, by the 16th century, many Africans arriving in Italy were enslaved. And another historian explains, the point of displaying dark-skinned servants was to suggest the potential universi potentially universal reach of imperial power. Regardless, by returning to 16th century Venice, Rossetti does not have to grapple quite so directly with the relationship between slavery and Africanists, slavery and race, slavery and color. Nevertheless, Venice was and has been persistently associated with blackness. Mark Twain was among the many 19th century American travelers who made such, such connections as he was escorted through the city by a black chicharrone born a slave in South Carolina. Twain remarks, quote, Negroes are deemed as good as white people in Venice, and so this man feels no desire to go back to his native land. His judgment is correct. So in The Beloved, Rossetti... Rossetti returns to a period and an aesthetic of what I will call either racial relativism or racial relationality. The central figure, Marie Ford, was initially intended to figure Dante's Beatrice, but she was not found suitable. Rossetti wrote, quote, I have got my model's bright complexion, which was irresistible, and Beatrice was pale, we are told. Rossetti instead, quote, proposed to find another subject to suit the figure. The bride from Solomon's Song is especially in my head. Immediately, the painting is understood in terms of color, even race, but not initially along the axes of black and white. It is the white Marie Ford who might not be quite white enough or not white enough in the right way. Rossetti's evasion of a racial binary is also made clear in his use of a racially diverse set of models in The Beloved. Marie Ford, the central English figure, Ellen Smith, also English, Kiyomi Gray, a Romani model born in Cambridgeshire, and of course, Fanny Eaton the mixed race Anglo-Jamaican model who appears in so many pre-Raphaelite works. And that picture from Stanford that's hanging is absolutely beautiful. Um, and she's also extremely important to Simeon Solomon, but that's neither here nor there. So the painting derived from the Song of Songs and also called The Bride refers to the beloved coming to her betrothed and to the viewer who gazes upon her. Or is he the beloved? Reciprocity is built into the encounter, an encounter the picture enacts more than it depicts. And its, referent, which contains, and its referent contains the line, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. The reference to the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon signifies racially for two important reasons. The first being its association with the Queen of Sheba and her encounter with King Solomon. Um, as we see here in Veronese's painting, um, this painting is really going to be very important to this project because Ruskin deconverts from Christianity in front of this painting while he's drawing a black subject who you can't see very well in this reproduction, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. Um, but this is, this is important. So the first is its association with the Queen of Sheba, and the second being that the Song of Songs contains the line quoted from the King James Bible, I am black but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Um, other translations of the verse read, I am black and beautiful, and obviously the shift in conjunction is extremely important. Um, Rossetti probably wouldn't have cared or known this, but the Hebrew conjunction is and, it is not but. Um, so the bride here is, is not black, um, the bride in, in Rossetti's painting, and um, as you can see, this follows a long art historical tradition of the bride being uh, rendered as white. But we shouldn't see this as a foregone conclusion. There is indeed a Western tradition of the Bride of Solomon being rendered as black, notably in the medieval Klosterneburg altarpiece in which the deep black face of Solomon's bride disrupts the gilded faces of the other figures. Both the black child and the black uh, and the bride share a frontal gaze towards the viewer and or the beloved, though the child's gaze is far more skeptical, less open, and less receptive. If Marie Ford fronts the beloved, the black child confronts him, not solely through her facial expression, but also through her closeness. And I'm using her here, even though we know the final model is male, and I can talk about that, but there are reasons I do think that this figure is meant to signify uh, a, a girl child. Um, 
In thinking about the nature of this confrontation, I want to turn to two versions of the formal concept of surface, drawing in a gesture of, again, what Liz Prechon calls generous influence, and I want to draw on the work of Krista Thompson and Jody Cranston. Modes of looking at surface, uh, surface allow us best to understand Rossetti's turn to blackness as a way of manifesting Venetian art. Krista Thompson writes of artists who, quote, use European and Renaissance Baroque pictorial traditions to visualize another history of art, one that brings the black body literary, literally and figuratively to the surface. She refers to what she calls surfacism as, quote, a concentration on the materiality or visual texture of objects within or of the picture plane. Thompson is interested in the ways black artists employ such methods as modes of resistance. But I argue we see similar strategies in the depiction of black subjects by white artists, perhaps to serve different ends, of course. Rossetti's work accordingly emphasizes both the materiality of the things depicted, bodies, jewels, fabric, ornament, and the materiality of the flat canvas and paint itself, themselves. Technical studies of Titian's works have shown how these things get conflated. In depictions of silk garments, for example, silk fibers have been shown to be amalgamated into the artist's glazes. So Thompson elucidates how surfacism works against Cartesian perspectivalism. Titian also de-emphasizes an earlier version of perspectivalism, perhaps that of Leon Battista Alberti, in favor of what has been called atmospheric perspective. His style is one of raised relief, proximity affected through the thick layering of paint rather than recession. His figures are ready to push through the picture and walk towards us. And nowhere does Rossetti imitate Titian more, more than in this. The bride unveils herself before her beloved, followed by her attendants, but the black figure in the front has already pushed to the fore, presenting the vase as much to us as the beloved. In a work whose depth of field is so insistently shallow, in a work so committed to its own flatness, the sense of movement forward is jarring in the way it compresses the aesthetic experience of encounter. The only sheen in the beloved is exhibited in the black model's face, even more so than in the jewels. And we see it a little bit in the vase as well. Um, we see a similar deployment of sheen brought into being through a well-placed highlight just under the servant's headband in Titian's late, roughly rendered, Judith with the head, with, and her maidservant with the head of Holofernes. Thompson explains how enslaved African bodies were greased to increase shine and therefore value. She writes, it sealed them as Fanon so succinctly described it in crushing objecthood. This reading is particularly powerful regarding the uh, juxtaposition sorry, of um, the black child with the other shining object in Rossetti's painting, the vase held by the child. Rossetti remarked in his letters, I am wanting a big showy looking jewel to paint in the N-word boy's cup in the beloved. The attachment of the glittering object to the model here, described in the most racist of terms, cannot be overlooked. But shine has another effect, particularly in relation to the matte rendering of the other figures. It brings the black figure, whose face is constructed by an array of overlapping hues with highlights under her eyes and on her nose, close to us in her dimensionality. It also contributes to her opacity. Her skin is reflective rather than translucent. One of the leading figures in the Negritude movement in the Caribbean, Edward Glissant, has written very importantly of a right to opacity, of particular import to, for minority subjects. And I think opacity is but one of the many places where the social and the aesthetic meet. Jody Cranston claims of Titian's work that he inaugurates, quote, a new paradigm that does not depend on the fiction of looking through the painting, but on experiencing the painting on the canvas. This is a central concern for Rossetti's painting and central to the claims of the book project from which this talk is derived. Toni Morrison famously wrote of black figures in American literature, quote, it requires hard work not to see. That hard work seems dangerously easy when presented with the temptation to see through, to imagine opacity as transparent. In Judith, Titian implies, employs a looseness of handling and a thick impasto that we will never see in Rossetti's work, even at its freest. The painting is opacity itself. Judith's pale face is arguably the most finished part of the painting, placid, stripped of the turbid and turbulent energies that make up the bottom of the picture, light against dark. But Judith's face is not the site of most interest. We are drawn to the knife, the severed head, the servant whose roughly hewn hand reaches towards that head. The thick impasto of the head, the range of shades, the rough brushwork makes it appear not only severed, but melting. 
In an earlier portrait of Laura Dianti and her black attendant, perhaps the painting that actually begins the pictorial tradition of, de of uh, depicting a white woman with a black attendant, one scholar notes that, quote, Titian dramatizes the point of contact. Fair hand and white chemise provide a foil for the silhouette for the dark face. This is one of the few places where Titian creates a hard edge, unquote. In Judith, something else happens. The figures all seem to melt into each other. As the black figure's barely perceptible hand reaches towards the decomposing head, her own head nearly merges into the shadow of Judith's arm. The visibility of the fracture, the labor of composition, becomes evident in bodily decomposition. Form becomes itself through deformation. Rossetti, in his imitation of Titian, never goes this far. His figures never melt into one another, merging into a fluid mass. There is proximity without a merge, however. The black child at the forefront of the beloved collides with the viewer, who is left with a choice, to cede to closeness or turn away. Louis Moren argues, speaking here of black as a color rather than a race, uh, says that black might be said to be a non-color by virtue of its absolute proximity to the eye, the non-color of pure contact. I've already argued against the notion of purity, and I'm not sure contact can be pure either, but it can be close. I'm going to skip this for now. Um, if Rossetti does not show his political hand in depicting the black child, he does show us his artistic allegiances and aesthetic principles. The aesthetic can be, but is not necessarily, an invasion. And queer theory actually is one way that can help us understand this. As Jose Estepan Munoz has explained, quote, turning to the aesthetic in the case of queerness is nothing like an escape from the social realm insofar as queer aesthetics map future social relations, unquote. And I think the same might be said for the aesthetics conveyed in The Beloved, complicit and complacent as Rossetti may be. He comes close to Titian, close to Venice, close to his own Italianness, close to another time and place by bringing the black child close to us. He only does this once, and he thereby denies the viewer a coherent politics. In the absence of such a declared position, the proximity Rossetti's aesthetic choices affect is uncomfortable. We, and I use we to be inclusive of all people who have seen this painting since its first display, are encroached upon by a figure whose meaning eludes us. The relations the painting demands are difficult ones, but I think we should inhabit them anyway. Thank you. But I will ask now Imogen Hart to come and give her paper, Dorothy Walker and Mae Morris in Relation. Here is Dorothy Walker in her drawing room at 7 Hammersmith Terrace with the coverlet Mae Morris embroidered for her mother across her knees and behind her in the corner one of the cabinets Philip Webb bequeathed to her father filled with glass Webb designed for William and Jane Morris. The scene is framed by William Morris patterns, wallpaper and a tulip and lily carpet that may have once been the one the Morris family used at their London home council house. The photograph represents a web of relations. Familial, Dorothy and her parents, Mary and Amory Walker. Neighbourly, the friendship between the Walkers and the Morrises, whose London home was a short walk along the river from Hammersmith Terrace. May Morris later lived next door to the Walkers at number eight. Professional, the working relationships between printer Emery Walker, architect Philip Webb, and writer, artist, and socialist William Morris. Institutional, the framework for collaboration and community that was provided by the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society and the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, in which Emery and Dorothy Walker and William and May Morris were all actively involved. This conference invites us to think about things in relation. The interior facilitates, indeed demands, relational thinking in several ways. First, the interior frames objects in a variety of media in relation to one another. For example, in the dining room, photographs of William Morris taken by Emery Walker and reproductions of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's drawings of Jane Morris and Annie Miller against Morris wallpaper. Secondly, 
through these juxtapositions, the interior can serve as a trace of human relationships. Oh, sorry, my slides. There we go. But what other stories could be uncovered by a relational consideration of Seven Hammersmith Terrace? In order to explore this question, I wish to focus on the preservation of this interior as a heritage site. Webb's cabinets and glass and the Morris & Co wallpaper and carpet are still in the drawing room. The embroidered coverlet lies on Dorothy's bed in the bedroom, which retains its Morris Daisy wallpaper and Philip Webb bookcase. I'll contextualise its preservation by Dorothy as the arts and crafts home in relation to Mae Morris's preservation of another important arts and crafts heritage site, Kelmscott Manor. I want to argue that the interior provides an opportunity to consider how different kinds of labour are related. In order to do so, I suggest that we need to be critical of limited notions of authorship and creativity. Understanding these spaces as sites of discourse and labour rather than as supposedly authentic survivals enables us to explore questions that have important implications for our discussion about relation at this conference. So I'll give you some background. In 1903, Dorothy Walker and her parents moved to Seven Hammersmith Terrace from number three, a few doors down. It would be her home for 60 years. By 1933, both of Dorothy's parents had died and she had inherited the house. When Dorothy advertised for a companion in 1948, Elizabeth de Haas, a Dutch woman, came to live with her, accompanied her on travels abroad and helped her to look after the house. Dorothy bequeathed the house and its contents to Elizabeth, who continued to live there until her death in 1999. Now run by the Emery Walker Trust, Seven Hammersmith Terrace has been open to the public since 2005. May Morris, the younger daughter of William and Jane and sister of Jenny, was 16 years Dorothy's senior. Kelmscott Manor, remote, located in a remote village near Oxford, became her family's country home in 1871. For the first three years, they shared the lease jointly with Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who left many of his belongings behind. Jane, Jenny and May continued to use the house after William died in 1896, and Jane purchased it before her death. Kelmscott was May's home for 67 years, and for the last 20 years of her life, she shared the home with Mary Lobb, a farm worker whom, Mary, whom May initially employed as a gardener. They became close companions, living and travelling together for two decades. On her death in 1938, May Morris bequeathed the house and most of its contents to the University of Oxford, although all her personal belongings were left to Lobb, who died shortly afterwards in 1939. May's intention was that Kelmscott would be, quote, a house of rest for artists, men of letters, scholars, and men of science, affiliated with the university, but her vision proved unsustainable. Kelmscott Manor passed to the Society of Antiquaries of London, whose property it remains, and it is a popular tourist attraction. While there are many arts and crafts houses that can be visited today, these are the two houses occupied by major figures in the arts and crafts movement, which display the collections of their former owners more or less in situ. They would not exist without Dorothy Walker or Mae Morris, who took steps to preserve the interiors while they lived there and to ensure that the houses and their contents would be saved for posterity. Kelmscott Manor and Seven Hammersmith Terrace were approached in strikingly similar ways by May and Dorothy, respectively. They were both self-consciously maintained monuments. Each daughter attempted to keep the house as much as possible as it had been when her father lived there. In a letter discussing her bequest to the University of Oxford, May noted that, quote, the furniture, etc., is arranged and the house remains almost exactly as it was in my father's time. In her will, she wrote, it is in the same condition as when he left it. As Julia Griffin has shown, archival documents recently acquired by the William Morris Gallery demonstrate May's deliberations about the future of Kelmscott. May repeatedly emphasises her desire to prevent change. And here are several quotations. My wish to keep Kelmscott as it is, keep things more or less as they are, keep Kelmscott as far as possible as it was, I mean even with the main furniture there. Similar ambitions were expressed for Seven Hammersmith Terrace. 
Dorothy Walker's intention to preserve the interiors her father had known is inferred from a range of sources, including the careful labels she attached to objects, the surviving photographs, and the re recollections of those who knew her. For example, Vivian Menel, whom Dorothy employed to dust Emery's library, recalled, it was Dolly's fervent and abiding wish that the house and books and other contents she knew how to preserve so well should remain intact as of national interest and provide posterity a legacy as interesting and enthralling as it had been for her. May and Dorothy cultivated narratives of preciousness and authenticity around the interior and its contents. Kelmscott Manor and Seven Hammersmith Terrace were both valued as reliquaries and pilgrimage sites. The word relics is frequently used in both cases. Both Dorothy and May took guests on tours. Here's May in 1912, 16 years after her father's death, painted by a friend on the threshold of his bedroom, which she maintained as a kind of shrine. Dorothy also seems to have kept her father's bedroom as it was for some time after his death. This photograph from 1939, six years after Emery died, bears the label Emery Walker's Room in Dorothy's writing. Under these circumstances, it is clear that both houses were to some extent already museums while being lived in. We can think of May and Dorothy as curators. Indeed, Cathy Haslam has called May Kelmscott's first curator. May prepared a detailed inventory that defined the significance of many objects. Among these items was, quote, four-post bed of Mrs. Morris Mare, in which William Morris was born. May's biographical descriptions contrast strongly with the more dispassionate entries in the official inventory of August 1939 after May's death, which was more concerned with condition than provenance, referring to the bed May described in such personal terms. The 1939 inventory listed, quote, Georgian four-post canopy bedstead with carved foot pillars with lion chintz hangings, palmet and valences, wood faded and chipped, hangings faded and stained. Side by side, these different approaches to recording the contents of the house highlight May's role as interpreter and historian. Meanwhile, at Seven Hammersmith Terrace, Dorothy labelled objects, fixing their meaning in a similar way. On a label attached to one object, Dorothy wrote, teapot which belonged to the poet Rossetti from Kelmscott Manor. At Kelmscott, May recorded Rossetti's belongings as DGR's things. I would like to consider the relationship between these labours of preservation and creative labour. Seven Hammersmith Terrace and Kelmscott Manor provide an opportunity to recognise homemaking and maintenance as a form of artistic agency. Such a view is supported by William Morris's definition of art as the expression of joy in labour, a definition that can encompass the labour of maintaining the home, selecting, cleaning, arranging, organising, recording. In addition to these administrative and physical tasks, the imaginative labour of May and Dorothy also needs to be recognised. Feminist philosopher Iris Marion Young called for, quote, revaluation of the private and public work of the preservation of meaningful things, and degendering these activities. May and Dorothy's homemaking and preservation work at Seven Hammersmith Terrace and Kelmscott Manor needs to be revalued. The processes of making these houses their homes over the decades following their father's deaths involved imagining the historical value their homes could have in the future and preserving the traces of the past with those future audiences in mind. Repeated claims that the interiors were unchanged since the time of William Morris or Emery Walker have tended to undermine the labour of caretaking that took place after their deaths. Acknowledging the work that has gone into producing these houses for more than a century allows us to examine critically any claim that they preserve an authentic past. Kelmscott Manor and Seven Hammersmith Terrace became arts and crafts monuments not through a passive process of survival, but through the active imagination and labour of May Morris and Dorothy Walker. The house's preservation has also depended on the network of personal and professional relations that links the two together. May consulted two friends in particular about her will, Sidney Cockerell and Emery Walker. Indeed, it appears to have been Emery Walker's idea to leave Kelmscott Manor to the University of Oxford. Dorothy Walker also discussed her own will with Sidney Cockerell. May and Dorothy may have talked about the future of their homes with one another. 
the earliest known set of photographs of the 77 Hammersmith Terrace interiors dates from 1939, the year after May Morris's death. In that year, Dorothy went to the Kelmscott estate sale where she was thought to have purchased that tulip and lily carpet. Elizabeth de Haas recalls that Dorothy, quote, was much distressed to see the dispersal of so many Morris treasures. Dorothy would have been aware of May's sense of responsibility as the proprietor of Kelmscott Manor, and it is possible that her friendship with May influenced her approach to her own home. While visitors are made aware of May Morris's and Dorothy Walker's important roles in preserving them, both houses in their publicity and conservation plans are nevertheless considered primarily significant because of their association with the men who lived there, William Morris and Emery Walker, respectively. In this patriarchal model, the focus is on the father figure and his familial relationships, his wife and daughters. Looking at the two houses in relation helps us to see that the significance of May and Dorothy's contributions goes beyond what they have enabled us to learn about their fathers. Both houses also make visible other relationships. Neither May nor Dorothy undertook the task of preservation entirely alone. Each of them benefited from the assistance of a domestic companion with whom they shared the labours of care and maintenance. It is significant that two of the most important English arts and crafts interiors we can visit today were produced by women whose lives, though very different in many ways, share a number of important characteristics. They were daughters of famous men, benefited from class and race privilege, lived with same-sex companions, and dedicated the last years of their lives to ensuring that their homes would be maintained as repositories of memory. Looking at Dorothy and May in relation enables us to recognise these parallels. To conclude, Seven Hammersmith Terrace speaks to a web of collaborations and exchanges between the Morris and Walker families and their wider circle. The interior makes visible the personal and professional networks that we aim to explore over the next two days. It also has the potential to make visible forms of labour on which the study of art history relies, but which often go unrecognised. In this panel on methodologies, I have tried to suggest that looking at Dorothy and May in relation is important methodologically. I offer this approach as a way of directing attention to the boundaries we draw around an object of study, whether that is a single painting, an artist's oeuvre, or a house. Seven Hammersmith Terrace points beyond itself, especially to May Morris and to Kelmscott Manor, which both, in turn, point back to Emery and Dorothy Walker and Hammersmith. Thank you. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce Kimberly Rhodes, who will be giving her talk on Shakespeare's sisters, sororal subterfuge, and pre-Raphaelite identity. Kim, welcome. In the art of the Pre-Raphaelites, Elizabeth Pratt John conjures Virginia Woolf's invention of Shakespeare's sister Judith in a room of one's own to introduce the Pre-Raphaelite sisterhood. Quote, Woolf imagines the works Shakespeare's sister might have made had a woman had the opportunity to write plays and poetry in the Elizabethan period. In fact, many of the male Pre-Raphaelites had sisters who made works of art. In addition, over the course of their careers, artists and writers of the Pre-Raphaelite movement constructed a kinship group comprising representations of sisters from William Shakespeare's oeuvre. This literary and artistic sorority includes works of art by women and men and often features members of the Pre-Raphaelite sisterhood as models. For example, Cordelia from King Lear, Isabella from Measure for Measure, Oh, oh, missed one. <laughs> oh, go back. Uh, well, there's supposed to be an Ophelia, but you can go out into the galleries and see that. Uh, <laughs> oh, there she is. We don't want to miss her. Um, Ophelia from Hamlet, Imogen from Cymbeline, 
And oh, I keep jumping the gun. And Viola from Twelfth Night. Ooh. Okay. Sorry about this. For some reason, I'm setting off the. There we go. Although many of these characters and their depictions have been parsed individually in both art historical and literary scholarship, this paper suggests the potential for considering them as a relational network, sitting next to and overlapping with the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and the Pre-Raphaelite Sisterhood. Some may question whether it is appropriate to mingle the imaginative with the real and the female with the male to make an art historical point about female agency, creativity, and sisterhood, as I will try to do here. It seems like a useful exercise, however, in a time when gender is constructed along a fluid spectrum rather than in strict binary form. We understand works of art have lives and afterlives separate from the intentions of their creators, and there are female contenders in Shakespearean authorship debates. On the one hand, situating Shakespeare's dramatic and artistic sisters in this way allows for continued assessment of how the Pre-Raphaelites produce novel readings of one of their immortals to address contemporary issues around gender and artistic identity. Shakespearean subjects were favored by conventional Victorian artists, and knowing this, the Pre-Raphaelites may have strategically deployed Shakespearean material to simultaneously assert both their English conformity and difference from an early stage in their development. On the other hand, segregating two of Shakespeare's sisters, as I will do in this paper, invites analysis of the relevance of unsettling sisterhood's attendant moral and affective expectations of virtue and acceptance of male superiority to the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. This model of female disobedience and its imaging troubles the gendered norms of the group's identity and ex exclusively fraternal associations from the outset of its history. Sororal subterfuge and pre-Raphael identity is thus approached doubly in this paper as they relate to the construction and application of the movement's foundational principles and the composition of its membership. To wit, two of the four illustrations printed in 1850 as part of the short live Pre-Raphaelite periodical, The Germ, renamed after a second issue as Art and Poetry, depict sisters from Shakespeare. Ford Maddox Brown's Cordelia and Walter Deverell's Viola. Hailing from distinct portions of the playwright's body of work, the figures nevertheless share the relational status of sister, a family position each disrupts through disguise. Brown's and Deverell's prints reprise these masquerades, one emotional and one physical, showing Cordelia rejecting her portion of Lear's kingdom and thereby by being construed as an unruly daughter and sister, and Viola as she cross-dresses as Cesario after being separated from her twin brother, Sebastian. Both of these prints connect to other works of art in Brown's and Deverell's output, and each of the artists contributed prose and poetry to the germ. For the sake of time today, I focus here solely on the etchings. In the catalog essay for this exhibition called Revolutionaries, the Rossettis and the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, Elizabeth Pretjohn surmises of the germ, quote, neither the miscellaneous content nor the mission statements printed at the end of each issue quite amount to a manifesto for the Pre-Raphaelite movement, but that may be their strength. Like Rienzi's oath, they mark the germ of a revolution that cannot be codified since it is yet to come. Perhaps one of these incipient revolutions it is embedded in the representations of Cordelia and Viola by Brown and Deverell. In each, the mistaken identity of a sister constitutes a crisis of confusion that drives the narrative forward much as the youthful pre-Raphaelite artists toyed with strategic subterfuge to confound art audiences and publicly stage their aesthetic rebellions. While only one woman, Christina Rossetti, contributed in a traditional manner to the germ through the publication of her poetry, she did so pseudonymously, as befits the theme of disguise here. Looking to Shakespeare's unconventional sisters may then help us both identify the participation of other women in the periodical, especially Elizabeth Siddle, 
and suggest alternative means for defining the early conceptual and artistic accomplishments of the Pre-Raphaelite sisterhood. William Michael Rossetti inadvertently drew attention to the importance of this informal Shakespearean group and the themes of kinship, disguise, mistaken identity, and revelation it evokes, whilst commenting on John L. Tupper's poem, Viola and Olivia, in his introduction to the 1901 facsimile edition of The Germ. In this essay, he noted that, quote, the verses are not of much significance. The etching by Deverell, however defective in technique, claims more attention as the viola was drawn from Miss Elizabeth Eleanor Siddle, whom Deverell had observed in a bonnet shop some few months before the etching was done, and who in 1860 became the wife of Dante Gabriel Rossetti. This face does not give much idea of hers, and yet it is not unlike her in a way. The face of Olivia bears some resemblance to Christina Rossetti. I think, however, that it was drawn not from her, but from a sister of the artist. By asserting that viewers should be interested in the print because of the presence of these women, two of whom were his sisters, rather than the questionable skills of its creator, Rossetti makes a case for the agency of the sisters in the formative years of the Pre-Raphaelite movement, albeit one that is still dependent to him on the proximity of their pre-Raphaelite brothers. Contrary to Rossetti's mostly subordinate positioning of Deverell's models, in the 2018 Beyond Ophelia exhibition at Wittick Manor, Hannah Squire, quote, included a copy of the germ from Wittick's library in the exhibition, open at the page featuring Walter Deverell's illustration to John Chupper's poem, Viola and Olivia from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Deverell was the first artist that will sat for as a model for Viola. This illustration and was therefore included alongside the photo of John Everett Millay's Ophelia, incorporated into an interpretation panel, to illustrate the story of the origins of Siddle's artistic career. Squire thus enacts an unveiling of identity as well, recasting Siddle's work as a model as part of her engagement with a professional network of artists, revealing the complexity of women's artistic identities in the Victorian period, and reminding contemporary viewers of the agentic force of artist models at the time. If I may take a detour for a moment, Squire's reclamation of the creative space for Siddle in the germ could perhaps be extended to, to include the Macbeths, purported to be the artist's only Shakespearean subject. The piece is thought to have originated in 1850, the same year Siddle's visage appeared as a viola and that Coventry Patmore anonymously published an essay on the play in the third issue of the journal. Patmore's essay focuses on Act I, establishing the scheming of the couple rather than the prophecy of the witches as the foundation for their violence. Siddle's scratched out ink drawing seems to depict Act II, Scene Two of Macbeth, wherein Lady Macbeth takes the bloody daggers Macbeth has used to kill Duncan from him, chiding her husband for his guilty conscience and galvanizing, galvanizing their complicity in the murder necessary for their rise to power. Patmore does not analyze this scene in his essay, although it represents the culmination of his argument. There is no evidence I know of to suggest that Siddle intended her drawing as a visual accompaniment to the essay, yet some of its features would make it appropriate for the purpose. The compositional intimacy of the couple bespeaks formidable and purposeful psychological and physical bonds, the aggressive scratching, mimic slashing, and the overall appearance of the work on paper resembles an etching with a similar scale to those published in The Germ. Whatever Siddle's plans for the work, however, it corresponds to a subject broached in the magazine, adds another active dimension to her designation as one of Shakespeare's sisters in the Pre-Raphaelite periodical, and contributes to the overall theme of this paper. While Lady Macbeth is not a sister, per se, she is a woman whose character has often been interpreted as masculine, yet another form of gender impersonation. Patmore's Macbeth essay in the March 1850 issue of The Germ was immediately preceded by Ford Maddox Brown's image from King Lear. And William Michael Rossetti's accompanying poem, Cordelia. 
This emphasis on Shakespeare's tragedies in the first pages of the issue was, according to William Michael Rossetti, a result of youthful negligence typical of the brotherhood in its nascent, nascent stage. Quote, for the belated number three of the germ, we were much at a loss for an illustration. Mr. Brown offered to accommodate us by etching this design, one of a series from King Lear, which he had drawn in Paris in 1844. That series, though not very sightly to the eye, is of extraordinary value for dramatic insight and energy. Dante Rossetti was to have furnished some verses for the etching, but for this he did not find time, so I was put in as a stopgap. And I'm not sure that any reader of the germ has ever thanked me for my obedience to the call of duty. Raw as it is, Rossetti's characterization of himself as obedient runs counter to the perception of Cordelia by Lear, Goneril, and Regan in the first scene of Act One depicted by Brown. In the scene, Cordelia expresses her love for her father with a candor that is misconstrued in the moment by Lear and her sisters as quite the opposite, and she is banished from the kingdom. Brown shows the moment just after Lear's exit, leaving the sisters bickering behind him as Cordelia is led away by France. Brown's image is presented across two pages so that the gutter of the periodical physically separates Cordelia from her sisters, making her as no longer part of this familiar group, having been falsely accused of not loving her father to the same degree of affection as her sisters. Cordelia's steadfast refusal to side with her sisters, even if it means being misconstrued, demonstrates her independent spirit, which could point to the Brotherhood's own desire to forge a new path in British art and letters and manifest their ability to interpret Cordelia as an agent rather than a victim, unabashed and strong, as William Michael Rossetti characterizes her in his eponymous poem. Like Cordelia's misconceived love for her father, the, pre the Brotherhood's reverence for art was often misconstrued as degradation of it during this period of the movement. Unlike his lengthy poetic analysis of Cordelia, William Michael Rossetti is mute on the subject of the Shakespearean sister Viola, conjured in Tupper's poem and Deverell's print in his 1901 introduction. Yet, the untangling of identity in his text runs parallel to her narrative of disguise, gender inversion, and revelation in Twelfth Night. Deverell's etching is inspired by an earlier scene in the play than that depicted in his oil painting. Showing Siddle as Viola, Deverell as Duke Orsino, and Dante Gabriel Rossetti as Festi. Here, he shows a portion of Act One, Scene Five, in which Viola, a messenger disguised in male clothing, carrying words of love from Duke Gorsino to Olivia, encounters the veiled countess and entreats her, good madam, let me see your face. Deverell departs from the play, however, by showing Viola lifting the veil from Olivia's face. By altering the scene, Deverell enhances both the romance and the metaphorical potential of their exchange. The two women gaze tenderly at one another as Viola gently holds the veil away from Olivia's face, embodying literally the moment in the play when Olivia falls in love with Cesario, Sash Viola, and symbolically the revelatory function of art. This reading is complicated though by Viola's masquerade in the scene, rendering the theme of disclosure only partial. Rossetti's identification of the models for the piece is also incomplete and muddled, suggesting that Olivia resembles his sister, Christina. It is tempting here to see Rossetti attempting to belatedly script a meeting between the two women who would become sisters in this loaded scene, even when it is somewhat certain that Christina and Elizabeth had not yet met in person at this time. Moreover, Glendiaud's characterization of the relationship between the two women as rivalrous tantalizingly befits the love tri triangle central to Shakespeare's play. The timing of Rossetti's 1901 commentary on the germ, which I've turned to several times in this paper, notably coincides with the era of the new woman and the feminist call for independence. No doubt aware of this movement, it may have influenced Rossetti to make his pre-Raphaelite sisters more visible to turn-of-the-century readers and viewers. Indeed, Rossetti's art criticism often demonstrates his support of women artists, and his immediate family was quite radical. 
Kristen Neubauer has pointed to cross-dressing as a gender performative strategy at the time, applying its disruptive power to pre-Raphaelite sister Eleanor Fortescue Brickdale's 1905 painting, The Little Foot Page. Comparing it to Shakespearean paintings, uh, early Shakespeare, one, one very early, uh, by John Everett Millay and Arthur Hughes, Neubauer asserts, quote, using pre-Raphaelite ideology of referring to sources of the past, the female figure in the little foot page appears as a new woman under the guise of a medieval narrative. Looking at the representations of Shakespeare's sisters in 1850, perhaps provides a foreshadowing of Fortescue Brickdale's revolutionary strategies. At the very least, it helps us see Shakespearean women in disguise, many of them sisters, revealed as instrumental to identifying the Pre-Raphaelites. Thank you. There's a way in which all of your papers actually give us a new perspective by adopting the point of view of women or a woman in relation to works that they didn't actually make, but uh, but but the, that that uh, they can be seen to um, be important for, and could we? describe that as a kind of a, 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 an important new method for art history, which might uh, would obviously solve some of the problems that have often been raised about the, the, the questions of the, you know, the, the, the dominance of the male maker of everything and so forth. But, but I guess my question is really, how do we actually go about enacting that as part of an art historical practice. And I think all of you have really interesting approaches to that. I wonder whether you could say something, each of you could say something about that to get us going. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, start. Yes. OK, thanks for the question. Um, so I think it's partly a question of thinking about what making means. Um, so. Uh, one way of expanding the question of, of creative labor is to consider how there might be there might, might, might be something quite limiting about seeing the manipulation of of physical matter as the only kind of artistic production and um, so seeing the, the creation of an interior or the, the preservation of an interior um, with a particular narrative as a kind of making um, and so we might think of parallels for that, such as um, Hannah Louis talks about the house museum as a kind of found object. And so um, we might think about, well, what, what, what might the model of the found object be for thinking about, well, that's, that's a kind of artistic practice which isn't about making something, but it's about making a work of art by naming something in a particular way. So that could be quite a helpful model for... Um, for, for, for thinking about interiors as um, not, not com completely unprecedented in, as, a, as a kind of um, a form of making. Um, so that's just to start off, but uh, yeah, interesting. So I would extend that maybe a little bit to think about making as conceptual making and the, and the conceptual underpinnings of making and where those lie. Um, you know, in terms of uh, in the work that I've been talking about here, uh, thinking about, you know, really, yes, these are all male, quote unquote, makers, but at the bottom of their thinking, I'm saying at least one part is women, right? Um, and these particular women um, whose parts, uh, whose literary sources may or may not have been written by man, as, you know, research is, is looking at now. So I'm kind of digging in that same way into thinking about making differently and with a difference, but maybe going, thinking about, well, where are the conceptual underpinnings of these, of these makers? What do these fictive characters tell us about actual making, if that makes any sense? Right, fascinating, yeah. Um, I think I'm going to answer somewhat obliquely. Um, so I was thinking about this as, as a methodological question, and this doesn't just apply to women, but 
one of the things that, that I've been thinking about in my teaching and my scholarship is, is I'll have students say, okay, so this work of art wasn't made for me, right? This isn't, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't the intended audience of this work of art. What do I do with that? And, and my answer to my students is always, well, you do whatever you want with it, right? You have, you have access to this, this work of art. You have access to this object, right? And, and you can make of it what you will. And you will make of it, what you make of it will come from your own sort of position, your gender position, your race position, what have you. So um, I think that that's one thing that I want to think about while, while working through the objects that this project requires me to work through, but also in general, um, I, just stuff that I think about as a teacher. Um, so yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Mm -hmm. yes. So can, can I open this up to the audience and see whether anybody wants to follow up on that or raise something completely different? Yes. Um, we're talking of new ways to look at the pre-Raphaelites, but I sometimes think, yes, we use the new perspectives. Um, how about considering Rosetti's early drawings of minstrels and black people, etc., which those type of singers were on the streets. They were playing in theatres. And the Rossetti children purchased prints from print sellers of different races and characters in theatre. And they made toy theatres with, you know, black characters in. I think it's very easy to sometimes <coughs> look at things through a 20th and 21st century perspective and forget about the time. And that's something that deters me. So, so I, I would say in answer to that, I think that's a great question. So I think that um, Rossetti is doing several different things in different, I think those early drawings are doing something very different from what the beloved is doing. And I mean, I think there's, you know, Mayhew, sort of lists in great detail the kind of various different racial groups and the kind of performances, street performances, that the Rossettis would no doubt have seen. So I, I do think that he is certainly, he certainly draws on minstrel traditions. One of those figures is named Uncle Tom, and he draws in a really, really, frankly, racist way on Uncle Tom's cabin. So I think all of that is there. But I think the beloved is doing something different. And I think we can we can say, if we, if we say the beloved is... My concern is if we say the beloved is acting in the same way as those other images, that we stop looking at the beloved as the very complex image that it is. So I, I think we have to hold those things next to each other in parallel, but I do think we can also consider them as different kinds of objects. But at the same time, when you're looking at the beloved, one can't help thinking what a wonderful portrait that And, and certainly that is, I mean, that is one way of, of reading the beloved. But I, I think, I think it's, it's complex. And I think that, yes, you can, you can read it as a kind of Benetton ad sort of diversity. But I don't, I don't, I like, right, that this is just, this is just beauty across the board. But I think something more complicated is going on. And I think it deserves that kind of attention is what I would say. So we, we, we're lucky enough to have the opportunity to do both of those things. And I've been seeing a hand at the back who wants to, someone who wants to make a contribution. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you so much that, so for a rich set of papers. My question is actually addressed to Natalie's paper, and I'm interested in the connection, your, the relational connection between Rossetti and, the, and Venice via Titian. But I wonder whether... Uh, you prompt me to think about the idea of Venice more relationally in relation to its economic trading partners and so forth, and, and patterns of enslavement, for example, in the Ottoman world, which generate a less, less simply binary kind of model of patterns of enslavement and racial characterization and so forth, um, with its own problematic history. But I wondered how much objects and economic trade relations might invite you to drift that way. And, and if you've already thought these things through, I'd be really curious. So I'm just at the beginning part of that, that aspect of the research, but I think absolutely that there are these 
particular parallels that, that the British are drawing on with Venice as a trading power, as a naval power. And I'm just beginning to, to look into those histories and exactly how I'm going to, to draw those connections. But I think that they're absolutely there. And I'm also beginning to read extensively about um, Venetian forms of enslavement. I mean, one of the really interesting things I literally just learned is that the word ciao um, comes from Venetian dialect, from the word chavo, schiavo, your slave, right? Um, and so there are these, all these, these linguistic things that speak to the way enslavement worked in Italy. And I'm, I'm at the beginning of that sort of historical research, but I'm very excited to dive in because I think it's going to really, um, it's going to be important for the kind of formalist work I want to do to have that context. Thank you. Yes, I was also struck by that as a connection among actually all the papers, um, the, the, the objects within interiors, paintings, illustrations, and so forth have um, multiple relations with each other and outside and connections that are, that are really fascinating as well. Um, now I'm going to come to Carol in a second, um, but I've, I've seen a, um, another head in the front row. Did Nicholas, would you? No, sorry. Carol. Um, I'm just going to... Um, Nat Natalie and Kimberly. Um, I was really struck by that sort of uh, motif of unveiling, uh, which you had in common the two works you were dealing mm -hmm. with, and um, what a sort of incredibly powerful motif that is uh, for that group of people. Um, but also, um, Natalie, you sort of... Um, teased us with this idea that um, the boy is a girl, <laughs> which again seemed yeah, to have a chime yeah. with Kimberly's paper um, um, with that sort of um, um, slipperiness of, of gender. I just wondered if either of you wanted to say anything more about that. Well, I will just say that when Natalie said that, I was like, oh! <laughs> it had been, I, maybe it was as I was seeing the exhibition through the lens as I was looking at it, having worked on this paper, I had that question. I had that question about the gender of that, that figure. So it did strike me and strike me as a powerful kind of broader thematic of, of veiling and, and gender slippage than I was you know, thinking of through this narrow lens of, of my work, and it kind of opened it up. So I'm fascinated to hear more about that. I mean, I, yeah, I, d I decided for this paper that, that she's a girl. I, I, I think I'm going <laughs> to stick with that. But I mean, I've gone back and forth many, many times looking at this picture. The, the contextual reasons that, that lead me to think that, that she is a girl, even though the model was a boy, was that first Rossetti did ask Board Maddox Brown if he had a black girl to model for him. So. That, that's my first sort of just biographical reason. The second is that I do think I read the painting um, in terms of the biblical verse, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, I view it as sort of a bridal entourage coming. And in that sort of sex segregated environment, there would not be a male child. So I really view this as, as, a, as a group of, of women. Um, and the third reason is that um, in my work on Simeon Solomon, he also doesn't seem to have a problem with partial nudity and the representation of biblical girls. Um, in one of his drawings at the Met, Miriam is presented as, as um, partially nude as well. So the nudity issue, that was sort of like, my, I'm like, oh, it has to be a boy. That sort of, I worked through that. So that's, those are the three reasons that I'm surmising that the figure is a girl. Um, but I'm, I'm not married to that. I'm, I can be convinced otherwise. <laughs> Yes, the, um, I see a hand very positively raised in the middle. Um, please forgive me, I, I, I do recognize some people, but the, the, yeah. the light in my it's eyes, and I think that's Clive. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. thanks. Um, what I recognized in all of your papers was uh, a strong sense of theater and um, something that Liz has written about, which I saw in the show about um, Freudian theatricality in relation to Manet and how you are interpolated by the gaze of the vision. Um, I was wondering how that relates to Kelmscott, um, in mm -hmm. that you have identities of people who are just there to preserve happenings that occurred once upon a time, and whether that sort of reveals anything about, the, I suppose, the researcher. What does that, what does that say about how you feel about these personalities and how they, these personalities are sort of curating a set for the imagination? It's a very, very big question. Um, so yes, yeah, so the House Museum is simultaneously 
a, a time capsule and a stage set because it's it's part of its appeal is the idea that it 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 has survived as it is. It's this stepping back in time, but on the other hand, you're very much aware that it has been curated in a particular way to give you a particular narrative. Um, but the objects are there to tell different stories. And so there's something uh, about paying attention to those and thinking about, well, what, what am I being invited to see? What is being made more visible through labels? What is being made more visible through the rooms that are open to the public and those that aren't? And what does that sort of leave hidden? Um, and in terms of theatricality, I think there's, 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 a, there's a clear sense in which May sort of had some rooms which were open to the public and that she would take people to see and other rooms that were more in flux. Um, so there's, there's a sort of maybe fragmentation of the interior into some parts that are more um, trying to look back in time and some that are more um, sort of uh, in the present. But um, I think that those things are... are, are that question of past, present, and future is really raised by these spaces because um, these two people are living in these houses, very much aware of the past, but they're living them in the present, and they're thinking about, well, what will this mean in the future? And so, yes, they are preserving them, but the very act of preserving them is sort of um, impacting on how they're lived in in the present and transforming them from actively lived in homes into these preserved spaces. So there's this sort of slippage between these different temporal moments. Yes. I'm uh, seeing a couple of hands back there. Yes, please. Yeah, please. Hi. And then there's someone just behind you in a, in a minute. Sorry, yeah. it's Good. Stephen. If I've got a couple of takeaways from, from, from that, it's to visit the Emery Walker house, which I think I sent some money, but never actually arranged to go and visit because it's a bit complex. And the Walker Art Gallery, which I, to my shame, I've never visited, but it clearly comes up on again and again. Um, a couple of questions. I, I'm always struck, as I get older, by what survives and why. And I'm quite moved that it does in defiance of everything. And there's, I remember reading, I think it was James Lees Milne who had the unenviable task of deciding what the National <coughs> Trust took on. And he's, he met with May Morris. He took an instant dislike to her, he, who wasn't impressed by William Morris, his work either, and said, it, no, under no circumstances can we take this on. And I think they also turned down the Red House on a similar basis and then took it on much later. Um, I have been to Kelm Scott Manor, it's wonderful, but if you see some of the, the sale catalogues or, or just the fly posters for what you could just pick up, it seems like you could just pick up an old-fashioned textile for, for a song, and yet, you know, it survived. Um, my second... My second... But in yet, sorry, what a, I think clearly there was an absolute devotion by May Morris to her father and in other things I've read and come across by other people with, with the William Morris Gallery in Walthamstow to him, which, which is how, somehow it's how it's kept it alive for us. My second question is, I just wanted to ask, I know it was very fragile, the, the finances of it, but how is the Emery Walker House doing now as a trust? Do you have any, any insight onto that? I, I'd really love to hear. I don't, I don't know the, the details of the, of the financial situation at present, but um, I know that it is run by the, the, the Emery Walker Trust, which was founded by Elizabeth de Haas before her death, which is why it is enabled to be open to the public now, and um, they have a collaboration with the William Morris Society, so um, that the, there's a sort of William Morris Circle and Hammersmith um, collaboration that goes on there. Yeah, I mean, the points about the, um, the fragility of survival are very important, I mean, because, of course, we don't actually have any Rossetti houses, and, and mm -hmm. we, we do have some 
Morris houses, but these things are ver very difficult. And in, in one of the things that an exhibition can do is to reimagine um, some of the things that have vanished and, and not survived and, and, and that can and make them alive again, um, possibly in different ways. There was another question just behind the previous questioner. Thank you. And then it, it's slightly follow on from some of the things you mentioned about the houses as being in relationship in, in past, present and future. How much did they change while these daughters were living in them? Because hmm. one has the image of you, you can't live in a museum however much you may be devoted to the artwork of your family and your, your parents, the, 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 how much change did they make to, to make them more comfortable for themselves? Yeah, so there's this huge paradox, absolutely, as you say, between the, the question of the museum and the question of the house. And uh, John Betjeman said of both Kelmscott Manor and Seven, Seven Hammersmith Terrace almost exactly the same thing, which was it, it, its appeal is it's not a museum, it's a house. Um, and yet it's kept as it is. So he's trying to have it both ways. So like It's kept the same way, but it's still a house. And that's exactly what uh, May wanted it to continue to be. She wanted it to be lived in by um, people rather than being a museum. But that was not to be um, in the long term. Um, so there's the, there, is, there is this real tension. And how much did they change? Well, if you... That we don't have the evidence to know exactly what changed when, but there is clear evidence that things did change. So then the process of, of making them what they are now is trying to undo some of those changes and take it back to a point in time, or as Kelmscott Manor is now trying to do, not say we're taking it back to a specific point in time, but making visible the sort of layering of history, um, but trying to be authentic to certain moments in time. So yes, a lot has been changed, and then you have to rely on other kinds of evidence to say, well, what would be the closest thing to how it looks at? And then you have to choose what time you want to try and go back to. So, um, so that whole question, as you say, of, of, the, of, the, of what, what was changed, a lot was changed. And so we don't really know exactly what the, that story has been. We have to conjecture based on the evidence that we have. Right. Charles, in the front row. Final question. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Just uh, wait for Ella to give the... Great, thanks. <laughs> I have a question for, 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 Kim, for Kimberly. It's about the Emma Sands picture of Viola. Um, mm. She's wearing something that sort of approximates to a Renaissance dress, and there's a castle outside the window. But the Visenian mirror appears to have a 19th century interior in it. Can you explain this to us? You know, that's, there's, I'm so glad you've brought that painting up. It's one that I have not, I'm moving into thinking about this project as a larger, a larger project. So it's just gathering images. Uh, you know, to show in context. And that's one that immediately struck me. It uh, struck me. And actually, what I found out doing a little bit of research about it is that there are questions about attributing that as a painting of Viola. Um, that it, it could actually, there have been different attributions. The Walker still does attribute it as Viola. Um, so I think, though, if we assume it's Viola and go to your question, um, one of the things I'm interested in that reflection of what appears to be a 19th century, you know, 19th century interior is this idea of the contemporaneity of Shakespeare, right? And the way that, you know, and this is something that I've worked on before, and you know, certainly something that shows up in the Shakespearean, the literary criticism in the 19th century about attributing characteristics of Victorian women to Shakespearean characters through Anna Jameson, for example. So I think that is, for me, one of the arenas I would like to explore if I do work on that painting would be just that, kind of 
how is that contemporaneity of these Shakespearean female characters portrayed? You know, what is the what is the differing iconography of that other than costume? You know, could it be, you know, something to do with a type of interior or you know something along those means? But yes, thank you. Great question. Yeah, so that painting, I think, uh, almost ideally sums up all of the, <laughs> the, the kinds of questions that we've been talking about in all of these. And thank you all for your questions, which I think have raised some very interesting ideas that we will take forward, and especially these ideas about relations between our present and the past of the, the artworks that we're looking at and the other pasts on which they draw in turn. Um, I'm sure that these are relations that are going to come up many, many times over the next couple of days. But for now, before we have a cup of tea, let's just give a round of applause to our great speakers.